let's get started. Um, so step one, uh, it is helpful to, to have, you know, a place to put this data and every, the walkthrough we're doing is configured to talk to Lightstep because that's where I work and that's who's sponsoring this workshop. Um, if you just go to that link, it'll ask you to create an account. This is, you know, easy enough to do. If you just click through, you can skip our little query and you should see this screen. And one thing you're gonna need to grab is an access token uh, out of your settings panel here. So just FYI, uh, if you're going through the, the walkthrough already, uh, over here in settings, you'll find this access token. And this is what you're gonna need uh, to put in uh, as an environment variable when you're getting started with the walkthrough. So I just wanna show you that right now in case you're trying to do that in the background. Alrighty, so moving on to the actual talk, um, we're gonna start with just an uh, overview of open telemetry, um, then uh, have some Q and A about that. Again, uh, you can ask questions the entire time, it's totally fine. Then at 10 a.m. we're gonna go into uh, a code walkthrough. We're just going to walk through this OTIL Python basics example and kind of discuss what the various API calls are. Um, that file contains everything you'd need to know as an application developer uh, trying to use open telemetry. There's a lot of complexity. If you look at open telemetry as a project right now, it's not uh, it's still in beta and a lot of it's not been encapsulated very much. So it's very low level. But uh, it's actually uh, the surface area you need to touch as an application developer is pretty small. And once you get used to it, it's pretty easy to do. So we're going to discuss all of that. So let's get started. All right. So one question people have is, uh, what is open telemetry? Like, uh, what is the scope of this project? And we named it telemetry for a reason. Uh, this is the Cambridge Dictionary's definition of telemetry, which is process of collecting information about objects that are far away and sending that information somewhere electronically. And that really does a good job of describing the scope of open telemetry. It's the, the generation and pipelining of telemetry data. Um, so let's go into just what the major like software components uh, and concepts are. If you're going to install open telemetry, let's say you have an API or sorry, let's say you have a service uh, that's the green circle here. Uh, for every service in your deployment, you're going to need to install the Open Telemetry SDK. So the SDK is a framework uh, that does all of the actual data processing of all the open of all of the observability data uh, getting collected up in the process. Um, it's configurable, uh, so you can change exporter plugins. You can add sampling plugins. Their lifecycle hooks if you want to connect this up to say um, your existing logging system and things of that nature. So, so there's a lot you can do with it, but uh, you don't actually have to touch it. Um, uh, we have a nice wrapper that makes it really easy, but uh, I do want to stress, you only want to be accessing this SDK during program setup. Uh, the SDK hauls in a bunch of dependencies because that's the thing uh, that does most of the work. Um, but you don't want to be accessing the SDK from your application code uh, or your libraries or anything uh, other than uh, setup. And the reason for that is because we have an API. So the Open Telemetry API is a separate package. It only contains uh, interfaces and constants and um, other uh, small pieces like that. This is sort of a loose coupling approach since observability is a cross-cutting concern that um, integrates with all of your code. We wanna make sure that there's a clean separation there. So the SDK, uh, even though it's a framework and it's very configurable, it is also swappable uh, behind the API. So if you take a dependency on the API, you're only taking a dependency um, on something that's essentially a no-op if you haven't installed an SDK. Uh, the way you get data out of open telemetry and out of your system is to install uh, instrumentation plugins for all of your 
uh, frameworks and libraries. You can also write uh, instrumentation for your application code, but you don't actually need to do that to get started. Um, ideally, you, you, sorry, ideally you find instrumentation for your uh, application framework, your server, um, and any kind of networking client you're using. So uh, clients that propagate you know, to other services are the most important. So your HTTP clients, uh, or any other RPC system you're using like gRPC. Uh, so those uh, plugins um, contain open telemetry API calls uh, and that then pipes all that data over to your SDK. So that's the basic setup of what's going on in your program. Uh, you have instrumentation libraries using the API, sending that data to the SDK. And then you can also use that API to instrument your application code. That SDK uh, then uh, exports that data. Uh, you can export that data directly to a backend, but we also provide a pipelining tool called the collector. So the collector is a separate service that you run. Uh, it's configurable through a YAML file and it does a lot of data processing. So you can use that to change formats, uh, to scrub your data, uh, to manipulate it in various ways. So it's a useful pipelining tool. You can also use it to say, tee your data off to multiple endpoints, and you can use it to, to buffer observability data, um, which helps you lower the buffer size on uh, what, you're contain what you are using in your application. So ideally, um, when you're doing observability stuff, uh, my recommendation is to keep your um, to, to keep your setup within your program simple. And then if you're uh, trying to manage your observability deployment, see if you can move as much of that work out uh, to the collector and make it an operational concern. Uh, for example, if you're changing things like data formats and whatnot, um, it would be great to be able to make those changes without having to redeploy your application servers and instead just redeploying uh, your observability servers. So the collector uh, supports a number of uh, frameworks. Sorry, can't talk today. The collector supports a number of different formats out of the box. Uh, OTLP is OpenTelemetry's native format. Um, it's kind of unique because it contains uh, both uh, tracing data and metrics data. I don't think there are other formats out there that contain both, but you can then split it out into uh, various formats such as Zipkin or Jaeger for tracing and then uh, Prometheus and uh, uh, hopefully soon stats D for uh, metrics. And of course you can install your own plugins uh, if you wanna talk for to another kind of backend. So for example, Amazon just released their distro uh, which includes things like X-ray plugins. So it can talk to X-ray. One reason we call OpenTelemetry a telemetry system is because it doesn't actually include any kind of analysis tools. Uh, and that's for a good reason. Uh, we see OpenTelemetry as a standardization project. So the point of the project is to come up with a universal language for describing uh, how distributed systems work in a cloud environment, uh, specifically from the perspective of transactions going through that environment. And we do believe you can standardize how you talk about that. Much of how computing works is fairly standard. And you wanna be able to look at these kind of polyglot systems where it might be some Ruby, some Java, some Python, um, and be able to look at it in a display that kind of unifies all of that. So getting everyone to agree on how to describe systems is the core uh, project behind OpenTelemetry. And things like the Open Telemetry API and SDK are things that kind of come out of that. But the core idea is actually specifying uh, how to do this. And uh, that's how we end up managing uh, our code within Open Telemetry. Um, we have uh, a spec, which is a sort of language neutral document that describes the way Open Telemetry should operate and the way you should define all of this data. And then that's implemented uh, in a number of different language uh, 
through the open telemetry special interest groups. And of course, you can uh, build your own implementation off the spec if you would like to, especially if you've got a programming language we're not covering. Uh, I do want to point out this is a lot of work. And this is actually why I'm excited about open telemetry, because if you want to build a new analysis tool, if you have some cool idea of some way of processing this observability data and doing something interesting with it, uh, traditionally, that might be a little bit painful because you would have to sort of reinvent this whole ecosystem of instrumentation plugins um, and whatnot, right? So there's a lot of work uh, already being done for you if you're just looking uh, to come up with some new form of analysis. Uh, since open telemetry is more of a framework than other tracing systems have been in the past, uh, it's a lot easier to uh, package it up as your own custom distro, maybe with your own uh, custom plugins and release that yourself. So I'm hoping to see a lot more of that show up in the future because of open telemetry. So do we have any questions at this time? Um, this is sort of the basic architecture. So if people are wondering about, you know, uh, uh, any other aspects of setting this up or running the collector, this would be a good time to ask. So Raj asks, uh, what are the drawbacks of exporting metrics di directly to a MySQL database as the backend? Will there be a custom exporter for this? Well, I don't know. Uh, there would be a thing such as like a MySQL exporter because the next question would be, well, how are you storing this data in MySQL, right? You would have to uh, come up with this uh, schema of some kind and put it in there. Uh, but the main reason people don't use something like MySQL to store this data is uh, the scale and uh, the rate of processing that has to happen. Um, MySQL is not uh, designed really to handle that kind of uh, OLAP workflow. Uh, you're much better off looking at something that's more like a time series database. Um, uh, Lightstep off, obviously is the thing you can use if you want something off the shelf. Uh, if you're looking for an open source project, Grafana recently released Tempo. Um, so that's, that's an interesting project to look at if you're looking at something that's more like a database. Uh, you could also look at um, how Jaeger uh, stores data in various backends if you want to get a sense of uh, ways to store this data yourself. Uh, usually the issue that comes up though is just the, the scale of managing observability data. It, you have this sort of observer's paradox of the more fine-grained information you want, uh, the more data you generate, uh, the more load you put on your system. Uh, and uh, actually managing that observability data can sometimes turn into uh, just as big of a task as, as managing the rest of your system. I know people have had that issue at scale. That's certainly a thing I've seen. And uh, I'd like to point out that all of the open telemetry instrumentation out of the box is designed to work in production. So uh, the instrumentation we provide, we try to ensure it's sort of right-sized in terms of the granularity to give you enough to root cause your problems, but not so much that uh, it's gonna swamp your system in production. Do you have any other questions? All right, well, we can move on. I will say that the Go people were much more interactive. So I don't know, Python. Okay, so moving on to uh, the next section here. Uh, let's just cover some core concepts just in case people aren't familiar with distributed tracing. It is a little bit different in terms of the fundamentals from just regular metrics or logging. Uh, and it's good to have an understanding of, of uh, what's different about it and, and why, why that's useful. Uh, so uh, just to cover uh, an understanding of what we think of as a transaction, um, this is just super obvious stuff, but let's say we're um, trying to describe a, a system that has a mobile client that lets you take a photo and upload it with a caption, right? So super basic thing. So you'll have a client and that client's talking to a server, but of course we know it's not just one server, right? Like 
that servers, let's say that's a proxy, and then that proxy calls out to an auth service to authenticate the request. When authentication works, it say, let's say it writes that image down to scratch disk. Uh, once scratch, it's written to scratch disk, it then calls an application service, a local application service um, with a link to that uh, local file. That service processes the image and uploads it to cloud storage and then calls out to a data service uh, to store the location of the image and the caption uh, in a SQL database and then caches that information in Redis. So this is what we would think of as a sort of a service map of a distributed transaction. And it's interesting to call this a distributed system because I feel like I've been looking at this exact same uh, setup for about 20 years. Uh, I'm literally describing a, a LAMP stack uh, in this particular uh, example here. But um, you can see that even back in the day, you already had a number of services talking to each other. And uh, this is not actually a new thing. And a lot of the pain that I think you solve with distributed pain, uh, sorry, a lot of the pain that you solve with distributed tracing is honestly pain I feel like we've always had. We've just gotten used to sort of muddling through and dealing with it. Uh, so you don't even need to have a gigantic humongo scale system to see some benefit, though that is, you know, honestly where, where distributed tracing becomes something more like a necessity. But when we think about distributed traces, uh, you can get a certain amount of information from this call graph, um, but not a lot. You can't really see things like latency, how much time was spent uh, in, one, uh, in one program versus the next, uh, what was the order of operations, what was called serially, what was called in parallel. And in order to get a, a visual look at that information, we tend to describe traces uh, or transactions uh, and something that looks more like a call graph. So when you're looking at distributed traces, you'll often see graphs that look like this. Uh, in this case, every color represents a different service, right? So we've got a green client, our blue, a reverse proxy here. Um, and the length of the line represents uh, how much time was spent uh, in that particular operation. And then the, the arrows represent network calls. So. Here you can see the client then called out to the reverse proxy, which called out to the auth server. And this is a really useful way of looking at this stuff because a bunch of information uh, pops out at you right away. Uh, one of the first things we wanna figure out is latency. Where was the time spent? Um, that's actually an interesting question to ask because it doesn't necessarily match which operation took the longest, right? So for example, our client span here, and we tend to call operation spans in open telemetry, our client span took the longest amount of time, uh, but it's not actually where the work was being done. It was sitting there waiting for most of the time while work was being done on the back end. So being able to figure out where the work was actually being done and where the actual bottlenecks are in your system is something that distributed tracing tools can do for you. So open telemetry will uh, provide the kind of data that lets you run a heuristic and automatically figure out uh, where the bottlenecks are in your system, or at least give you a good guess. Uh, in addition to figuring out where the work is being done, uh, it also lets you know um, where systems are waiting. And especially if you're running in a single threaded environment uh, or an environment with resource contention, sometimes that waiting also means blocking. Uh, so that can be useful information to understand. But um, in this particular case, we can see that most of the time was spent uploading that image to local scratch disk and then uploading the image again to cloud storage. So if you say decided you wanted to go in and optimize your data service and do a bunch of fancy, fancy algorithms and atomic pointers and somehow make this data service super, super, super fast, um, that wouldn't actually move the needle very much in terms of the user's experience of how long the request took. Because at the end of the day, uh, this data service only took a tiny portion of the overall transaction. Uh, so being able to quickly see that visually and understand it uh, is some useful information you get 
uh, out of the kind of call graph that distributed tracing uh, generates. The other thing that you can see are errors. Uh, of course, when you're root causing something, you want to quickly understand which service was generating the error versus uh, which services were simply propagating the error back down. Uh, so you might notice on your client that you're getting 500s or something like that, but was that showing up from auth service? Was that showing up from you know, your cloud provider? Uh, so being able to quickly identify which component was originating the error uh, is another primary usage of these tools. And when I'm saying these tools, I mean, this is what you use logging or anything for, right? Like this is just observability. Uh, speaking of logging, the other thing you wanna do, of course, is get some fine grained information, right? Like these operations with all of this timing information uh, is useful, but if you're trying to actually root cause something, you wanna look at the logs. Uh, and so open telemetry uh, comes with what we call trace events, but you can basically think of these as logs they're just logs that are contextualized in the context of your trace. So uh, when you look at your trace, you're automatically grabbing all of the logs that are pertinent to it. And last but not least, the, the real killer feature here is, is correlations. So all of these events and all of these spans um, can have a set of attributes attached to them. And those attributes are basically key value pairs that allow you to index these operations and group them up. And that's really, really useful when you're trying to root cause a, a problem in your system. You wanna be able to notice patterns and trends and understand that say uh, a certain error is associated with a certain set of project IDs or a certain latency is associated with a certain host or region. Uh, being able to do those correlations uh, quickly and easily is something that you get out of the box with a system like open telemetry. Now, of course, you can do all this stuff with logs and uh, I certainly have for many, many years. Um, the issue with uh, the traditional log based approach, at least as I experienced, is actually being able to filter down and scope down to just the logs that are relevant for the particular problem you're trying to diagnose. So if you're trying to say, look at this particular uh, transaction here, um, in a regular logging system, you would have to start uh, filtering out, finding request IDs, and maybe you get one ID, so you filter by that, and maybe that gives you access to another thing that lets you find, say, the, the client side, uh, logs that were associated with this transaction. Um, so of course there's, you can index all of your logs, but uh, the index you would really want would be an index like a transaction ID. If every log had the same ID stapled to it in the transaction, that would be really easy to find uh, in your logging backend because you could just find one log, notice the transaction ID, do a query for that and then get exactly all of the logs that were associated with that transaction, regardless of uh, which system was generating it. And the same thing goes for the more tightly scoped operation. So you wanna be able to find uh, first and foremost, all of the logs in your overall transaction, but then also find say just the logs that are associated with say a client operation. So, uh, those two IDs, the trace ID and the span ID, um, that's sort of the, the core, um, core concept behind distributed tracing. Uh, I assert, other people have a different opinion, but I assert uh, if you have a trace ID, uh, then you're doing distributed tracing. It doesn't matter uh, if you're putting that into logs or not. It's just distributed tracing tools like open telemetry give you a lot of other really useful stuff out of the box. For example, by uh, actually linking all of these logs together in a call graph. So you actually have a graph describing this stuff in code. So you understand the relationships a lot better. Um, so that, that's the reason why you wanna maybe go with something like distributed tracing. Uh, and in order to pull this off, the way you actually get these transaction IDs uh, is a concept called context propagation. So context propagation is sort of the, the core fundamental concept 
underlying open telemetry's architecture. If uh, you can get your head wrapped around context propagation, then everything else is going to fall into place. So this is the one big concept that it's useful uh, to grok if you're going to uh, use open telemetry. Uh, it'll make everything else make a lot of sense. So what I mean by context propagation is, let's say you have you know two services A and B, and you've got a transaction going between them. So you've got some operations in A and then a network request linking to some operations in B. Uh, context propagation has two parts. The first part is what we call a context object. So a context object is basically a transaction uh, scoped um, environment. So it's a, a bag of key value pairs that follows uh, the course of execution uh, through your program. Uh, so open, some languages have this uh, built in. Uh, Python is one of them. So open telemetry uh, leverages Python context, but uh, that's sort of a core concept. You need to have that context flowing properly. So you'll notice that uh, under the hood in open telemetry, uh, there's a context object that it's uh, pushing and pulling things out of. Now to actually get this context to continue on the other side of the network request, uh, we have to be able to serialize that context uh, and pass it along as metadata. And we call that process propagation. So propagation is the act of taking all of these, uh, um, all of these indices and IDs that are important for keeping track of the trace, um, serializing them in the case of HTTP as HTTP headers, uh, and then deserializing them on the other end. And the terms we use for that are inject and extract. So uh, you'll inject your context uh, into your HTTP request in the client. And then in your server, you extract the context in order to continue uh, flowing it through your program. Now, I wanna stress that you don't manually have to do any of this. Uh, if you install instrumentation libraries for uh, all of your kind of uh, framework and context management tools. So uh, if you install a plugin for say Flask or Django, plus a plugin for any HTTP client you're using, uh, if you're using a, a user land scheduler, you know, like a, a G event or something like that, you would need a plugin for that since uh, that's switching context all the time. But all of this code should be centralized. You shouldn't uh, be having to manually call inject and extract uh, in your application code or anything like that. Um, so uh, it's important to understand these concepts, but when you actually get started with open telemetry, uh, you're dealing with most of this just by setting up and installing plugins. Uh, you just need to have it in your head that this is what's going on under the hood. And once you get this context propagation going, you know, it's easy to see that flowing something like a transaction ID would now be simple. Uh, if you've got this sort of underlying framework already built up, you can just create an ID uh, at the beginning, add it to your context, and then um, every span or event that occurs along the way just pulls that ID out of the context uh, and it writes it out as part of, say, writing out that log. So that's the basic idea behind context propagation and distributed tracing. Uh, this is important enough that I want to stop here um, and see if there are any questions about this. Uh, have people encountered this before and had some confusion or frustration? Is there anything about this uh, that doesn't make sense? Well, feel free to post questions in the Q&A uh, if you come up with any. Ooh, and here's one. Serg. So trace IDs should be generated on our proxy and forwarded on in that case. Um, actually, yeah, in this case, the, the trace ID uh, would be generated uh, at the beginning on the, the beginning of the client. So the very first um, operation in the client, uh, when you create your first span, uh, if there's no parent span, it will automatically generate an ID uh, and pass it on. 
And uh, again, this stuff kind of happens uh, under the hood. And yeah, so spans are grouped by trace ID. So if you can think of uh, spans as a collection of events and the start span is like a start span event and the finish span is a finish span event, uh, all of those events would have the same span ID and the same trace ID. And then when it called over to the reverse proxy, um, all of the events here would have a new span ID. So new span ID would get generated here, but they would also have the same transaction ID or trace ID. Uh, so that, those are the two major groupings, trace and span. But as I mentioned before, you can also add your own attributes to these things. So you can make your own grouping uh, using all of those attributes. And uh, that's very critical. Uh, critical thing to do. You do get a lot of that out of the box though, and I'll talk about that. Um, but getting back to uh, propagation, um, one thing that makes this tricky is obviously your, uh, your two systems, your client and your server here, have to agree on this propagation mechanism. They both need to have a shared understanding of what HTTP headers they're looking for. So, you know, if this one injects into header A and this one's looking to extract from header B, then propagation is going to get broken. Uh, so you need to make sure that everything is configured to use the same propagation headers. So that's, that's a gotcha um, because there are a number of them out there. Uh, B3 uh, is Zipkin's uh, tracing header, and that's become something of a de facto standard. Um, but we don't think de facto is good enough. So uh, we've actually been working through the W3C to get some of these tracing headers uh, standardized and part of the official HTTP spec. So that's coming along well. Um, just to look at what these things are, you'll be able to see the, these with Wireshark or something if you're looking at your actual requests. Um, these headers, uh, the first form of them are tracing specific headers and that's called the trace context spec that consists of two headers, trace parent and trace state. Your trace parent header contains uh, the trace ID and the span ID of the parent operation. Uh, it also contains a sampling flag since some systems uh, do head-based sampling where they're flipping a coin right at the beginning uh, and only recording say one out of 1024 um, traces. So that's a way when your system scales up to the point that it's too expensive to record every transaction, um, rather than setting debug equals true and reducing the granularity of uh, the data you're getting per transaction, you simply reduce the overall number of transactions that you're recording. So you're now getting a sample of what's going on in your system. Uh, but if you're system is large enough that sampling uh, should be good enough uh, to give you a good concrete view of what your system is doing, especially if you're using a system that does tail-based sampling like LightStep, uh, because that will allow you to say, um, uh, sample out uninteresting data uh, more heavily while retaining uh, interesting data more heavily. For example, um, uh, ensuring that errors always get retained uh, is something that we do. So more advanced tracing systems will start, you're gonna see more and more of this uh, happen. Um, but if you read about old school distributed tracing, you'll hear about sampling being a core concept. That's really kind of going away. It's, it's moving to a more complicated way of doing it. Uh, but anyways, that's, that's all kind of under the hood. The main thing you just need to know that is that um, this trace parent header will have your trace ID and span ID in it. There's also another header called trace state. This is for internal details, like any additional information a particular tracing system um, wants to propagate just for itself. So let's say, you know, there's like, it has its, instead of using a sampling flag, it has a concept of sampling priority. And so it wants to propagate that stuff. So that's what you'll see in trace state. Again, as an end user, you don't really have to worry about that stuff. Uh, that's sort of like internal details. Uh, but I do want to point it out because you'll see it in the spec and you'll see it in your HTTP headers. The other headers we're trying to standardize right now, and this is also coming along well, are called baggage. So baggage is much more like just generic context propagation. Uh, this is literally a way to flow arbitrary key value pairs through your system. 
So while trace context is specific for setting up this kind of tracing observability, baggage is just a way to sort of take uh, your in-process context object and make it a distributed context object where uh, every operation in your system can add things to that context and pull them out uh, regardless of how many hops away they are from each other in a transaction. And uh, we'll, I'll show you why that's useful in a bit when we get into our code walkthrough. Uh, do people have any further questions on these tracing headers? Uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward stuff, but um, if people are wondering anything about this, please let me know. Otherwise, we're gonna, we're gonna move on. And it looks like we're actually um, running a little bit ahead of time. It's 9.45. Um, if we wanna get going early, that might be fine, but I'm gonna see if I can contact uh, one of our Python maintainers uh, to come in uh, and help with this walkthrough. So let me see if Alex is around. So this binging Alex to hop in. So I pinged Alex, he's gonna be showing up. Oh, Raj got a question, good. On how exporters work. So Raj asks, uh, how does one manage the life cycle of the push controller thread for each process service sending metrics? Will it be one additional thread per process or service that pushes metrics? Where does one find documentation about the scope of metrics instruments? Uh, when should I shut down the exporter thread? Um, yeah, so um, exporters, uh, it depends on which exporter you're talking about. So you mentioned push controller. I kind of am guessing um, maybe you're thinking about the Prometheus exporter, uh, but this would actually be a good question uh, for Alex. So let me see when he hops on. But generally speaking, um, uh, you shouldn't be having to manage that stuff uh, directly. Um, there is a, a shutdown call that you need to call just at the end, end of your program to ensure a clean exit. Um, but that's really it. Uh, you, you shouldn't be having to, to dig in under the hood uh, and deal with that stuff. Yeah. I, uh... I jumped in, but I missed the question. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, no problem. So here, I'm just going to um, repost Raj's question so that you can see it. I know Zoom doesn't, doesn't hold on to this information. So he was asking about um, exporters and processing metrics. Yeah, I think your I think your answer was correct. You probably shouldn't have to manage the shutdown of the exporter itself. Um, I think we I think we added an explicit shutdown on the exporter for traces, and I would suspect the same thing will happen for metrics if it's not already there. Um, sorry, I'm not I'm not super familiar with the metrics exporter on the side. Yeah, but yeah, we should mention that this is sort of a tracing focused walkthrough right now. Metrics. Uh, Metrics are still uh, much more in beta. We don't expect those to be stable until Q1. Sarah asks, is it possible to export traces locally as files for local development and debugging purposes? Uh, yes, you can export them to the console. Um, I don't know if we have a file-based exporter built in. Uh, we do have a console exporter though. Yeah, you can you can use the console exporter, which outputs JSON, um, and then I guess you could probably do like send it out to a file or whatever. Yeah, 
So if you if you wanted to get fancy, you could you could implement on your own exporter and and contribute it to the community. <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, we'll show you how to how to actually set that up. It's just an environment variable. You know, hotel debug log level equals true will will get you those debug logs. Uh, and that is very useful when you're trying to diagnose an error in your instrumentation if you turn those debug logs on. Um, and by the way, I should actually uh, introduce Alex and maybe myself. Uh, I just mentioned my name is Ted, but I'm actually one of the co-founders of the project. I'm on the governance committee. Um, you'll see me around a lot if you show up to any open telemetry meeting. And Alex here is one of the maintainers of open telemetry Python. He also happens to work at Lightstep. Okay, so let's maybe move on to a code walkthrough. So I'm gonna, in a minute, uh, switch off and let Alex share his screen to actually walk through setting this up. But if you haven't done so already, um, uh, if you joined late, here's some of these links again. Uh, you can find the slides here. I'm just going to post in the slides since these have the links in them. Uh, but what you're going to need uh, for this walkthrough uh, are these three items. Uh, so if you haven't created an account in Lightstep, uh, that bit.ly link will, will send you over there. Um, and then you can find the walkthrough code, which Alex is going to walk us through. Um, and this thing uses what we call the, the open telemetry launchers. So just to explain what these launchers are real quick, um, open telemetry has a concept of open telemetry distros. These are just prepackaged versions of open telemetry. Uh, a lot of the configuration you need to do with open telemetry is configuring it to talk to a specific backend. So once you've picked the backend that you want to talk to, uh, most of that configuration becomes boilerplate. So rather than copying and pasting a lot of boilerplate, uh, we're just packaging these things up as distros. So the open telemetry launcher is the Lightstep distro. Um, AWS just uh, launched their own distro. So you'll find that there. Um, so you should be seeing these things show up more and more. And we'll start, um, if you go to open telemetry IO, we have a registry where, that we're gonna start populating with a lot of this information. Uh, so, uh, I would say, yeah, in the future, start looking for distros of open telemetry if you're looking to connect it to a specific backend. And now for this walkthrough, I'm gonna stop sharing uh, and hand, hand it off to Alex. Great, let's do it. All right, can you see my screen? Yep. You should be seeing a terminal and, uh, and GitHub. That's correct. Perfect. All right. So for the sake of this uh, walkthrough, I just created a like a local Docker container running Python, um, just to ensure I have a nice clean environment since I have hundreds of virtual environments all over my local desktop. So um, I decided this would be a better way to go about it. So what I'm just going to do is simply copy the copy and paste instructions here. Um, and let's see here. So we'll start by making a new virtual environment, which is unnecessary here, but I'm going to do it anyway. So you'll need virtual ends for Python VM dash M, Python dash M VM. Yeah. Let me do it. So now I'll just source. Cool. All right. So we have. I'm actually going to activate it in the other app, in the other window as well, just so that I have one for the client and one for the server here. Uh, and I've already exported my uh, access token, um, so I don't have to do that here. But yeah. So now we'll just install the required packages. Assuming. Oh, right. 
copy and paste works better if you actually follow copy and paste instructions and not just make up your own halfway through copy and pasting things, which is what I'm doing. All right. Okay, so it's going up and installing. Oh, it's done, cool. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna export my LS service name, which is going to populate the service name um, that we'll be seeing for identifying traces in the Lightstep backend. Uh, and then I'm going to export this tracer provider. Um, so by default, if you don't configure a tracer provider, what the, the default is to use the API tracer provider, which does a no op um, implementation of tracing. But um, what we'll do here is we'll use the SDK tracer provider. So we actually get like the exporter and the span processors and all that good stuff. Uh, and I'll do the same on the other window. And now what I'll do is I'll run the server. Um, so this is running the server using the open telemetry instrument um, run script, which will load any, um, basically what it does is it runs through a list of pre-installed entry points uh, and the entry points will load instrumentation for any libraries that you have installed on your, in your local environment. So if you're, for example, um, I haven't, actually looked at the code yet, but if we look at the code here, we can see that, you know, here we're using Flask and we have installed the Flask auto instrumentation. And so what will happen is because we're running this open telemetry instrument uh, script, it will load the Flask auto instrumentation through the entry point that we've installed for the Flask instrumentation. Yeah. Um, we so that the code Sorry, the, the code itself doesn't require you to manually instrument Flask. It will just do it for us. Yeah. And uh, uh, we skipped over it a bit because we're just using a requirements file, but uh, OpenTelemetry does come with another command, OpenTelemetry Bootstrap, uh, which will um, automatically install all the available uh, instrumentation libraries for you. Yeah. So that's a that cool thing to run uh, because, again, one, one of the most common ways uh, uh, context propagation gets broken is, is failing to install uh, instrumentation for a client uh, or a framework. Yeah. So let's see if we, oh, it's not mentioned here. Well, that's a, that's a thing we should fix in, in the documentation. Apologies right now for the current state of our documentation. It is an open source project. But yeah. uh, we are in the process of cleaning that up. Um, and if you go to otel.lightstep.com, I'm actually in the process of creating a lot of um, uh, additional documentation. Uh, these are going to be things like quick start guides and uh, uh, cookbooks and things of that nature. Um, but uh, there's not a heck of a lot there now. But if you look through here, you'll see a slightly out of date way of doing this I'm gonna today. Oh yeah, all right. We'll we'll update all of this at some point. <laughs> Make it, making notes to update these things. All right. So now we'll start our server here. Um, so you can see it's running. And then in the bottom window, I'm just going to run the client, which will connect to it. Um, do you want to do you want to walk through what the the client is doing now, or do you want to kind of do that after? Yeah. So this is literally the the world's simplest example. Uh, in its current state, it's just a, uh, it just creates a single request um, using the request library to a, a server that prints out hello world. Um, so it's super simple, um, but included in here is um, uh, every single API call you may want to, you may encounter an open telemetry in the process of, of instrumenting your own app. Uh, so this really is all you need to get started. Uh, the one thing we can do maybe a bit later, Alex, is I like to wrap this up in a, just like a for loop that creates five requests um, so that we can see a more interesting trace. But uh, that's just uh, some live coding we could maybe do later. Uh, the first thing we want to do is just uh, just run this and, and see the traces in the back end. Yeah, sure. So we'll go back to here. All right, cool. So we can, so you can see the output here. Um, 
So this is the output from the console span exporter. Um, it's showing us the trace information that it sent out. You can see there's, let's say there's an internal span, then there's the client span that got sent up and another internal span here. All right, cool. And then, sorry, on, on the top here, we see an error. Um, this is something that's been fixed in the latest version of OpenTelemetry Python. There was a bug that was introduced in the console span exporter. So apologies for that. We'll, it'll be updated with the next release, which should be today or tomorrow. All right, um, so should I bring up the Lightstep dashboard to see if we can see our traces? Cool, all right, so do you wanna talk a little bit about the Explorer, Ted? Yeah, sure thing. So um, if you look here in Lightstep, uh, we have something that's just called the Explorer view. Uh, this is basically like a, a console for looking at trace data. Um, there's a, you can make queries up at the top, but uh, the most, the easiest thing to do is if you come here and just hit refresh, uh, you'll just see your latest spans, uh, especially if you're just running, you know, a small, small environment like this. And so if you click through on, you can see, yeah, we've got four spans um, because that's what this thing makes, two spans for the client, two spans for the server. And if you hop in here, uh, there's a bunch of information you can see that we're talking about before. So you can see um, uh, all of the spans. You can see how much time was spent in each of them. And if you notice, there's a black line uh, running through that graphic. And that black line represents uh, the critical path. So that's the places where work is being done. So in this case, all the work is just sleeps. Uh, the other thing I really want to point out is uh, you're on this uh, request span right now. Uh, and if you look over the attributes, you'll see that it has a bunch of attributes automatically added to it. Um, so you have HTTP method, status code, uh, status text. And then if you look at the server side uh, at the Flask instrumentation, likewise, you'll see uh, a bunch of HTTP information, including things like route, um, as well as- uh, um, User agent and a bunch of other stuff in here. Yeah. So there's a bunch of data that's automatically added and we refer to these as semantic conventions. So one of the things that we define uh, in the open telemetry specification is not just uh, the data format, but what keys and values you should use to define these common operations. So uh, if I just uh, get you a link to that stuff, I'll post a link to that in a minute. Um, but uh, that's something you will want to use uh, in your own code. Uh, if you are doing things that are somewhat standardized, like interacting with network protocols, if you're, um, uh, then you're going to want to use this stuff. So let me, let me link you through to that real quick. And I just, uh, I just noticed here that our our service name is different than the thing that was exported earlier. And let me just quickly try to fix this here. I think the, uh, I just realized that the example code is configuring manually the name of the, the service mm -hmm. rather than using the environment variables. I'm just going to change that quickly. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple different ways to configure this stuff. Almost everything can be configured either through environment variables or, or through code. Yeah. Of course, if you do both, one's going to win and it's the code that wins. Right. Yeah, that's that's an important thing to know that code always wins, or at least that's that's what it should be. Yeah. All right. So if I send the trace again, now if I look again, I should see like there you go. Hello, client. Hello, server. All right, cool. That makes more sense. <laughs> I was I was looking at this. I'm like, this. Wait a minute. This isn't the right service. <laughs> so, cool. Yeah. And, and uh, the by thing. the way, th this video is recorded, and we're going to put it out on YouTube. So if some of this advice is just flying by, just uh, you'll get a link to the video afterwards, uh, so uh, you can scrub through some of this if if you missed it the first time. Great. Sorry, if, if there's questions, I, I can't see them because of 
Zoom hiding my window for me. But. Uh, I'll let you know if there are questions in the chat. Okay. So, yeah, the next thing might be to go in and just look at these actual API calls. Um, uh, so uh, you'll notice that the instrument, so the basic instrumentation of the request library in Flask, uh, that was done for you automatically just by uh, running your program with open telemetry, uh, open telemetry instrument. Um, but obviously you're going to want to decorate that information further within your application. Uh, so yeah, if you wouldn't mind maybe bumping up your, your text size there. Sure. Yeah. Great. So uh, if we look uh, in our route, uh, we can see we've done, we've got a couple of things going on here. Uh, the first thing you're always going to want to do is get access to the current span. So the Flask instrumentation has already created a span uh, to measure uh, your handler, uh, but that span is also accessible to you. So you don't actually have to create a span uh, to add events and attributes. Uh, you can just get the current span that was created by the Flask instrumentation. Uh, and continue to decorate that with your own attributes. And I recommend this. This is actually a best practice uh, to have fewer spans um, with more attributes and events. Uh, that allows the indexing uh, of, that goes on in these tracing systems to work better because they tend to work best when all of the attributes uh, are on the same span. They, can, they usually can do the most with that. Obviously, you do want to create child spans uh, when you have a, a particular sub operation uh, whose latency is important enough that you want to uh, separate it out uh, from the parent span in terms of actually setting up alerts and monitorings and things like that on your back end. But uh, you can, of course, just through looking at the timestamps on the events within a span, get a sense of where time is going within a program. Uh, so creating child spans is really associated with wanting to be able to actually like set up some monitoring and doing something with it. So you don't need to reflexively say, put a span around every function or something like that. Uh, that would be way too much. Uh, but you do wanna create child span. So in this case, we're sleeping a bit in the parent span, and then we're gonna create a child span and do some more sleeping within there. And uh, that just uses the with pattern uh, in Python. So you just, uh, say start as current span, and we've just named this server span uh, because it's it's just whatever, we could call it do work. Um, and uh, what that means is now within this with block, when you call uh, get current span, uh, it's uh, this new server span that will be the one returned. So we're using it directly as, as span, but you could also grab it uh, grab it from get current span just to make clear make that clear and you can see we're setting an attribute in here called project id and we're setting this from a baggage value um, so if you actually hop over to the client real quick you'll see in the client that um, we're calling set baggage uh, so set baggage will create a new a new context uh, with this baggage value. So in this case, we're writing project ID one, two, three. Um, I would love to see baggage get wrapped up in its own width, but right now uh, you have to do an attach detach. Um, and what that means is uh, the context available between that attach and detach uh, will contain that baggage value. And the reason why it's like that is you, you want to scope these baggage values. You don't want to want to active you don't want to ac accidentally leak them uh, through using some kind of shared object. So context objects tend to be immutable for that reason. Um, and that's why you see these with patterns and things like attach detach, because uh, when you set up a context, you're really setting up like a scope or a closure uh, with a new environment inside of it. Uh, so in this case, uh, we create a new context with project ID one, two, three, and then that lets us pull project ID one, two, three off on the server. And so this might be a useful thing to do if you were saying, trying to um, uh, index by project ID in a service that say, didn't directly have access to that project ID. It might be that uh, 
it would need to make an extra database lookup just to get it, which would be expensive, or maybe it doesn't even have direct access to the kind of service that would give it that project ID. Um, so being able to flow these things through when you need them uh, is a really useful feature. Uh, and being able to index your spans by project ID would be really useful because what that lets you do is identify, say, traffic patterns that are associated with certain accounts. It would be really useful to know when you're trying to root cause a problem that all of the errors are actually originating only from a handful of projects as opposed to evenly distributed across all of the projects. That would tell you a lot of information right there about what you need to start looking for. Uh, so that's baggage. We also just have regular events. So span add event. Uh, this is basically OpenTelemetry's version of logging at this time. Um, so you can see it's just like any kind of structured logging you might do elsewhere. It automatically adds a timestamp, you give it a message, and then you can give it uh, a dictionary full of attributes uh, to associate with that particular event. There is also a special kind of event, which are exceptions. So maybe we should have a look at exceptions and error handling at this point. So Alex, if you want to pop in maybe to your code and, uh, and just uh, uncomment out our exception there. We can see what sure. traits look like when they have an error on them. Sure. Um, yeah, actually, here to make this a little bit more interesting, what I'll do is I'll just change the client to change the baggage or the project ID. So, let's see. Sure. Nice. All right. So we'll restart the server and run the client again. And we should see an error somewhere in here. We're just, yeah, there we go. All right, zero division error, that makes sense. And okay, cool. So let's see what that looks like if we look for it again. Awesome. All right, so let's see if this all worked the way we expected it. So yeah, so now you can see our span has an error here. Um, so, so really what happened was on, in the back end, the code recorded an, an exception. So there's a record exception method that you can call with open telemetry, um, that allows you to, it, what it'll do is it will add an event with all of the information about the exception that occurred. So here you can see like exception type was set to zero division error. Um, the message is the message from the error. And then there's like a, a stack trace here. Which is super handy if you're if you're looking into why things blew up. Mm -hmm. um, and then just to touch on what you mentioned about the baggage, um, like it's cool because now you know I have this ID that I can search for, um, and you know you'd be able to identify that only project ID like nine 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 for example triggered these errors, not not all the other projects. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And it's not just about doing that manually. Uh, these systems like LightStep can start automatically doing these correlations for you and uh, pointing them out. Um, so that's why it's useful. And I just mentioned we're, we're saying project ID, we're using it with baggage. Uh, ideally, you, you should avoid uh, baggage when possible. If you can get these values locally, that's better just because the more baggage values you add, the more metadata your requests are carrying. So you're going to, every baggage value you add will um, bloat uh, the size of your payload. Uh, so, so there is a limit to how much baggage you can use. So you wanna be a little sparing with baggage, uh, but you should be aggressive with setting attributes on, on anything that looks like uh, a useful way to segment your data. Uh, and Ranga is asking about gRPC. Yes, G gRPC is supported. Uh, Open Telemetry comes with uh, with gRPC instrumentation, um, and actually, I think gRPC may be natively instrumented with Open Telemetry at this point. Uh, but uh, so yeah, that that's supported. Um, and in general, uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, is a supported environment for running all of this stuff. Cool. Um, so that's the basic, I don't know if, um, it would be good to show off, uh, 
like catching an error and setting a status, maybe that's like overkill. Um, yeah, we can, we can do some of that. Uh, let's see. So since we're responsible people, we're not going to divide by zero without without catching it. So let's see. yeah. And here we'll, so this is the, the method that I mentioned earlier um, that you'll want to be, you'll want to be using when you're, when you're actively catching exceptions and you want to be recording these somewhere. So you, it's a, it's a method on a span, which is called record exception. Uh, and you just pass in the exception object itself. There is, um, there's some work being done to add additional attributes if you want to override like attributes or timestamp or something like that. Um, but that's not, that hasn't, uh, that's not supported just yet. Um, do you want to do you want to talk about the difference between errors and exceptions, Ted? Yeah. Um, so not every exception is an error, right? Uh, if uh, exceptions might be normal part of life, for example, um, if it's not unusual to try to write or read from a file and discover that file isn't there, if that's you know for whatever I don't know. Let's just say an imaginary application um, that uh, will do something with a file if it's present. Uh, you might get an exception file not found in that case. Uh, you'd want to record that exception, but that's that's not an error. Uh, that's expected behavior that that you're actually handling. Um, so you may have exception events that aren't errors, but likewise you might be in a situation where you know that an operation has gotten into an error state. It is bad. You do want it to count against your error budget. You do want it to page you, um, but maybe there isn't an exception per se associated with it. So you don't have to raise an exception in order to report an error. Uh, the way errors are actually handled is by changing the status of the span. So every span has a status that's uh, by default unset and you can set it to error um, manually if you want a span to count as an error. And so if you have an uncaught exception, what OpenTelemetry does is it automatically records the exception and then sets the status, uh, status to error, but uh, you can do that yourself. Yeah, so, so you'll have to bear with me here because this interface changed recently. So I might, I might be setting it wrong, so. All right, let's see. Um, right, so here we're recording the exception and then separately we're gonna make a call to set status. Um, it's worth noting that this status canonical code is uh, being updated to say like dot error uh, in the next release of OpenTelemetry Python. But right now we're following the gRPC codes in the version that we currently have installed. So um, apologies for that discrepancy there, but. Yeah, this is something we simplified recently. And in case you haven't uh, picked up on it, uh, open telemetry is in uh, Python's in a slightly unstable place right at the moment because uh, we're prepping up uh, for 1.0. So we're trying to get you know all of the changes we want to make in now rather than later so that we can lock this down and stabilize it. Uh, so that's also another reason to, to stick with the automatic instrumentation in the meantime. Uh, that really should give you enough granularity. Um, but if you're just sticking to that and then basic stuff like setting attributes and adding events, you're not really gonna see much of this breakage um, because it'll all just get automatically updated for you as you switch versions. So that's how I would recommend uh, running OpenTelemetry Python at this time. Yeah, and it, it is worth noting that we're getting, we're getting pretty close to the RC1 release, which I think we only have like a few issues left before we can we can call the like the tracer API at least somewhat stable. More and stable than before, I guess is probably a good way to qualify it. Yeah, more will be more stable. And then once once we hit GA, then we we're going to have a very firm long term support guarantee and backwards compatibility guarantee uh, as for the uh, instrumentation API, since that code is going to be everywhere. Uh, we really, really don't want to break it and have no intention of doing so. Oh God, dinging things go away. Um, 
So uh, there will be a long-term uh, support guarantee once we hit 1.0. That's why we're making a bunch of changes right now uh, is we wanna get that in and, and really lock it down. Uh, there is also a support guarantee with open tracing and open census. Just to hit on that really quick, someone was asking, uh, Serge, Serge was asking in uh, the chat, uh, what's the story with open census? Uh, so very quick uh, origin story here. Um, open census and open tracing uh, were two separate projects with almost an identical pedigree. Um, they, they were slightly different in the sense that open tracing was a little more focused on ensuring this API layer was separate uh, from the imp in implementation layer and uh, open census was much more like just an implementation, uh, but they didn't quite work with each other. Uh, and both projects uh, had the same goal of trying to standardize how we do this. And they were both based on the Dapper paper uh, written by Ben Siegelman, who's now the CEO of Lightstep. Uh, but when he was back at Google, uh, he invented a system within Google called Dapper. Uh, and both census and open tracing are based on Dapper. So they were literally almost identical. And people in both camps were like, at first, like, whatever, we can have multiple projects. That's fine. That's normal. You've got Postgres, you've got MySQL. But as time went on, it became clear because this was a standardization effort, that that usual rule didn't apply. Like, as long as there were two things, we were going to be in this, like, XKCD scenario where we're just spewing out new standards. And we thought that was gross. So we bit the bullet, um, took, took a year off to, to reset the whole thing. Uh, by merging these two projects into open telemetry. Uh, so that did delay um, getting this stuff into production, but you know, standardization is slow and it takes time uh, for this very reason. So that, that's where the project actually came from. So uh, once open telemetry is stable, um, open census and open tracing uh, will be sunsetted. Uh, they both had a code freeze put on them already. Uh, but they will be a backwards compatibility layer. So with open tracing, there's already an open tracing shim. Uh, so your existing open tracing code, if you're already using that, um, will talk to the new open telemetry SDK and it interoperates with uh, the rest of the open telemetry, open telemetry API calls. So you, you can switch over to the new open telemetry stuff without having to get rid of your old uh, open tracing uh, API calls. Uh, you will want to swap out maybe the, the plugins that you're using or don't install the open telemetry instrumentation libraries if you're still using the, the open tracing instrumentation libraries. You don't want double instrument, but other than that, uh, it totally works. And um, the census team uh, over in Google, I believe, is going to be providing a, a similar bridge uh, to census so that if you had instrumented your application with census, and then wanted to progressively switch over by starting with uh, the new SDK, you could do that. Um, but I think that work is still in flight. Uh, since I come from the open tracing side of the fence, uh, uh, the one thing that uh, I'm not really paying attention to is, is the open census backwards compatibility. But um, uh, Google is doing that. And you can always hop into one of our Gitter channels uh, and ask questions there about the status of some of these things. Um, or hop on to one of our calls. Uh, if you go to community, let me just put a link here. Um, our community repo contains everything you might want in terms of figuring out how to get a hold of the project and who's running the project and how the project's structured and stuff like that. Uh, you can find all of that in this community repo. Sweet. Nice. Yeah. Um, also, uh, if people are interested in more of the, the backstory or other things and want to hang out, uh, we are having a community day as part of uh, KubeCon. Uh, so let me just put a link to that in case people haven't seen that. Um, so this will be on November 17th, Then we're running this as an unconference. Uh, so there will be a lot of breakout rooms. Uh, where people can ask questions and interact and and get under the hood with a lot of this stuff, but we'll also be you know have ask the maintainer section and uh, me and Morgan McLean, uh, who are two of the founders, are going to give 
a more in-depth history of the project. So if you're interested in that, you should show up uh, and say hi at our community day if you're going to KubeCon. And that's basically it for this walkthrough. Uh, so even though there is a lot of surface area to open telemetry and it is changing around, um, I do hope the one takeaway from this workshop is just looking at that uh, open telemetry Python basics GitHub repo, um, because that if you look in there, it's really tiny and there's, there isn't any surface area that you would really need to interact with that isn't in um, that uh, server.py or client.py file in there. Um, so that truly is all you need to know to get started with this stuff. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, we've been getting a number of questions about Celery. Uh, I know we happen to have Celery instrumentation, but uh, do you happen to know much more about that, Alex? Uh, I guess I can uh, get blame and figure out who is working on it. Yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, there was an initial implementation uh, done and I know some rework done as well. Um, I don't, I don't have a lot of um, knowledge around what, what the details there are other than it exists. And I know, I know there was some issues and the, some of the issues were addressed um, around it. Yeah, I know there was some interest from the salary, someone on in the salary project to put open telemetry natively into salary. Um, I, I don't know how far that that got along, but I know that was some talk of that maybe four or five months ago or so. Yeah. And in fact, we're hoping to see a lot of that in the future, though I, I'm currently suggesting those people hold off until we stabilize the API, um, just so we're not creating trouble for them. But yeah, once the API is stable, then you should be able to, to directly instrument a lot of these things, especially stuff like Celery or things like G event. Uh, anything that manages control flow and context. Um, if it has open telemetry built in and you're not using open telemetry, those calls are just no ops. So the overhead is minimal. And then if you do install uh, any kind of observability tool, you automatically start getting data uh, and the context is automatically propagated. Uh, so we're excited to see more of that show up uh, next year uh, once we hit 1.0. Sweet. So I think that's it for this uh, workflow section. Um, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, we're going to go on break now for 30 minutes and uh, we'll be coming back at 11 a.m. And for the final section there, we're going to uh, cover uh, how you actually roll this stuff out within your organization. Uh, what, how do you plan uh, for something like this since it's a little, a little bit more of a, a broad lift uh, than you would do rolling out something like logging or metrics. So thank you so much, Diego. Awesome. And thank you so much, Alex. Um, and I'll see the rest of you at 11 a.m. Yeah, thank you. Hope people had a good break. And let's get in uh, to this next section here. So I'm going to share my screen. One sec. Okay. So here we go. So for this last part, uh, we're going to go over just some best practices and uh, a kind of advice about getting started uh, rolling this stuff out. Um, so uh, I alluded to this before, but I think one of the ways uh, people go wrong with something like open telemetry is just creating too many spans. So I do wanna emphasize that you don't need a lot of spans. Um, in terms of how many spans should you have, it's it's kind of a vague question. But if you think about uh, the relevant scopes, uh, there's the overall transaction, there's the process, um, there's a library. So that's every time there's a code base transition, um, and then there's the functions. And spans live somewhere between the library and the function level. 
So it might be a single span coming out of a library. Like for example, the request library generates a single span when you use it. Uh, and that's totally fine. That may very well be enough. In some cases, you may need a few uh, uh, additional internal spans, uh, especially if there's a certain amount of parallelism or just something more complicated that that library is doing. Uh, but you definitely do not need something like a span per function. Uh, it, in general, you don't need to be measuring uh, uh, latency on that level, uh, but there's also some practical considerations here. One is that spans are more expensive than logs and events. Events are cheaper. Spans cost a little bit more just because they are calculating timing. Um, there's a little bit of state getting juggled. So I don't wanna you know, scare you and make you think spans are ridiculously expensive, but the point is you know, there is the observer's paradox. You know, there, there is a cost that comes with doing some amount of observation. So you don't really want to be doing more uh, than you need to. But uh, there's also another subtler issue, which is if you create lots and lots and lots of little spans, you may end up smearing out all of your attributes across lots and lots of spans rather than pooling all your attributes together on the same span. Um, and since uh, most tracing systems are kind of span based in terms of how they let you um, aggregate data uh, or set up monitoring, alerting, and things like that. It's much harder for these systems to say, show me a trace where uh, span A has attribute B and span C has attribute D. Uh, it's much easier to say, show me a trace where span has attributes A, you know, B and D. Um, so uh, consolidating your attributes onto fewer spans uh, results in better indexing. Uh, so it'll actually work better uh, if you don't spread your, your indexing around a lot. Um, so that's my practical advice. Uh, keep it very uh, coarsely grained. Uh, keep your, your tags and attributes clustered together. Um, uh, use logs uh, the same way you would use logs uh, today. Um, and uh, as much as you can, try, try to centralize um, a lot of this code. Uh, it's really much better um, to find a way to say wrap uh, a library or a handler um, and uh, sort of automate the setup and teardown of current spans and things of that nature. If you find yourself doing a lot of copy pasting of things like, you know, span setup or teardown or just a lot of copy pasting in general with this stuff, uh, at a level that's beyond just say making an attribute or um, adding an event, that's maybe a sign that some of that code should be centralized somewhere. Um, that'll make your life easier and it'll make it more likely that other developers are properly instrumenting things. Uh, you, you, uh, observability has a tendency to be kind of uneven. Some developers just log more than others. We don't tend to test our observability or or apply standards. Um, and that matters a little bit more with distributed tracing because you have things like context propagation going on. Uh, so if it's uneven, uh, that, that might be worse. And the less developers have to do in order to get the observability that you want, uh, the, the better it's gonna be. Um, and uh, again, if you have any uh, questions, uh, practical advice ar around stuff, your own questions, uh, just post them in the chat. I'm happy to answer them. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to move on to getting started here. So rolling open telemetry out again, because you have to get this context propagation flowing. Uh, you do need to be a little more coordinated uh, when you go to, to roll this out across your organization, uh, especially if you're in a larger organization um, that has a number of, say, separate service teams or just a large engineering floor. Uh, with a lot of services, um, uh, you, you'll need to, to plan a bit how you're going uh, to deploy this stuff. Um, and the main reason uh, this is going to be an issue is, is that the bulk of the code does live in the instrumentation and the setup, right? So that's where kind of the bulk of the work is going to be, is around setting up and deploying this stuff. Uh, so 
you, you kind of want to have a plan. Um, if it's easy enough to centralize how you deploy this, for example, if you have, say, a way to, to you've centralized your packaging or everything uses a common framework or a common set of libraries, if you can find a way to centralize the work um, and deploy everywhere, that's the best. Um, but if you can't do that, uh, you want to maybe avoid trying to boil the ocean. So if it's unfeasible to actually just uh, deploy tracing to all of your services um, in a quickly, uh, in a sane manner, if that's looking like it's going to be a little difficult, um, I recommend an approach of finding a particular transaction that you want to measure. Uh, Usually uh, this should be a high value transaction, right? So, you know, maybe this is like checkout transaction if you've got a web store or something like that. Something that that's, has some business value associated with it. Uh, ideally the best is something that has some business value associated with the latency, um, being able to reduce latency um, uh, in an important transaction where users are sensitive to that latency um, is a great way to, to kind of have the value of distributed tracing start to hit home for people. Um, and it could just be a, a known problem that you have in your system and you, you just want to debug it. So, so having a particular target um, allows you to identify maybe a smaller subset of services that you would have to instrument in order to get this one particular transaction instrumented. Uh, so figuring out that target and then just doing um, the minimal amount of work needed to get context propagation flowing everywhere. So rather than going into one system and instrumenting it deeply and then going to the next and the next, I think it's better to uh, just deploy, you know, the automated instrumentation uh, and the basics to all of the services involved. Ensure you get that context propagation flowing and that high level trace available um, and then once you've got that rolling, then you can expand uh, and start digging into details and, and adding, adding more. But uh, once you see that initial trace, that initial complete trace with all of that data on it, even if it's coarsely grained data, that's, that's going to probably be an eye opener. Um, I find uh, it's pretty common uh, if you haven't been running something that, that lets you measure latency in particular like this. Um, uh, that there's some low hanging fruit that can show up, things that, that are taking a surprising amount of time and then you go and look in them and discover there's something happening in serial that could be easily parallelized, uh, things of that nature. So it's, it's often easy to find a couple of quick wins um, that will get other people in the organization excited uh, about distributed tracing and then wanna do the work of, of adding it to their own services. Um, so that works a lot better um, than, in my opinion, than a boil the ocean approach. And sure enough, that's where things do go wrong is if, uh, if you're not organized about it and you do try to boil the ocean, the, the sad pattern that I have seen happen is someone, maybe one of you is really excited about this stuff and you wanna champion it. And then you kind of go around uh, asking and begging various groups to say, hey, you should add this, add this to your service. And some people will do it, some people won't, the rollout will be inconsistent. And then you end up with broken traces and kind of incomplete data. And so it doesn't look particularly valuable in that state. Uh, and those efforts tend to, to peter out. Um, so you really want to have high quality data. And the best way to do that is to get uh, transactions traced from start to finish. And so, you know, the ways, of course, that you can accomplish this is through project management. As engineers, project management is not our favorite thing. Um, but uh, if you're in that boat, uh, I do recommend finding a product manager or project manager, an engineering manager, uh, someone in your organization um, who's sympathetic to the effort and also thinks it's important and say, hey, we need to, you know, like we need a plan if we're going to do this. Can you can you help me? put a project plan together um, and uh, be a little more organized. You know, just in terms of org charts, it's sometimes easier to go up the org chart and back down rather than trying to sideload your, your requests into various teams. 
Um, so I do recommend uh, uh, partnering with someone to do the project management if you feel like you're not positioned within your organization to do it yourself. Um, also, I've seen it be super helpful to centralize a lot of the resources around this. So, you know, putting in your own internal wiki or somewhere all of the documentation uh, and gotchas or uh, in one place, just so people have a good starting point uh, for all the information that's relative to your particular organization and your particular deployment of uh, something like open telemetry, plus links out to the relevant docs uh, for open telemetry. That's a really helpful resource uh, uh, to share around. Um, and if you can figure out a way to, to again, move all of this stuff into some kind of stand, uh, centralized place, you know, helper libraries uh, that um, turn things into one-liners and, and stuff of that nature uh, can really make things uh, feel a lot easier to use. So those are helpful. Um, and just like how open telemetry has its standard semantic conventions for describing standard operations like HTTP and database requests and things of that nature, you might have your own conventions for uh, sort of application specific concepts uh, and uh, developing those out um, and putting them uh, uh, into a framework that's similar to uh, the way we do this uh, in open telemetry. So you can see here, we have our HTTP uh, specification specification here, and we're just describing the name of each attribute, its type, uh, what it's for, and just some examples of what you know what the data format should be. Uh, regularizing all of this stuff uh, really really helps you on the back end when you're diagnosing problems. The more uniform the data is coming in, uh, the better the analysis will be going out. And so we're providing that uh, for things like HTTP clients, but for things that are specific to your organization or application, um, obviously uh, we can't provide those for you. But I do recommend um, doing something like this uh, if uh, you are building up um, the kinds of keys that uh, people are gonna be needing to add in various places uh, and just ensuring that, that you have a kind of consistent uh, experience in terms of the data quality. So I think that's, that's a pretty critical thing. Um, at that point, last but not least, uh, if you feel like you're struggling and would just like help setting all of this stuff up, uh, uh, something we're trying out here at Lightstep is just uh, an open telemetry quick start consultation. Uh, uh, consultation. Uh, so what this is, is just um, uh, literally a consultation with uh, people on my team and our customer success group to come in and actually do hands on keyboard, uh, help you set up and roll out open telemetry. And just to be clear, this is just a, a, a one time consultation. It's not related to, to buying Lightstep as a product or even using Lightstep. If you want us to help you set up open telemetry and connect it to something else, that's, that's totally fine. Um, uh, we just want to throw this out there uh, because sometimes just, just getting this stuff installed and set up can be the, the hardest part. Uh, so if that's of interest to you, you can contact us at support at lightstep.com. And we're at the end at this point. Uh, so I just want to leave you uh, with this cheat sheet of uh, you know all the basics just to go over. So just to do a quick review, um, there are four languages I, I currently see as being in a production ready beta. Uh, so what I mean by production ready beta is things like the APIs uh, may have some breaking changes. You may have some breaking changes at the code level, but the, um, the, the code is ready for uh, production usage in terms of how it works uh, at runtime. Um, so we consider this stuff uh, to be stable enough uh, to, to be deployed into production in these four languages. But as I mentioned before, you maybe want to, to stick with the automatic instrumentation to avoid having to make code changes uh, if the API breaks before we hit 1.0. Um, in terms of getting more resources, we've got OpenTelemetry.io is of course the project web, website. Uh, 
We're going to be putting a lot more documentation and stuff up there in the coming weeks. Uh, but that's a centralized resource that will link you out uh, to all the GitHub uh, repositories associated with the project. Uh, all of the information is actually stored in GitHub in those GitHub repositories. We try to, to keep everything centralized there. Um, so just going to our GitHub organization uh, and looking around is also very useful. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm writing my own uh, documentation site to, to sort of buttress uh, the core API docs and other things that are going to be coming out of the project itself. Um, so you can have a look at that if you want. We'll have updated Python stuff uh, coming by end of the week. Um, and if you're looking for updates about any of these docs or open telemetry in general, uh, I do a post on Twitter. I have a rather low volume uh, open telemetry focused account. Uh, so if that's of interest to you and you're on Twitter, you could follow me there at Ted Suo. So that's my handle, T-E-D-S-U-O. Um, and you can also send me a DM on Twitter uh, if you have any follow-up questions or anything like that. And last but not least, for org buy-in, again, I really want to stress the best way to go about rolling this out at a large organization is pick a known main pain point or an important transaction. Uh, instrument just put in the bare minimal amount of instrumentation needed to capture that transaction from start to finish. And then uh, use that instrument instrumentation to, to look for outliers, um, um, look for latency outliers, look, looking for errors, uh, looking for other low hanging fruit associated with that important transaction. Uh, if it's a complicated enough system and uh, it's doing important work, uh, just turning this stuff on may lead you to an insight. So I would really encourage you to give that a shot. And that's it for the workshop.